Hey everyone, Selwyn here from WingStrength.com. On this video, I'll be bringing you day three, week two of the Dark Horse Training Program by Brian Olsru. Uh, the Dark Horse Training Program is a free template available uh, from Brian Olsru's YouTube channel, as well as a spreadsheet has been made available as well on liftvault.com. Uh, which outlines a program and is a really easy, simple tool to use to help you execute the program for yourself. I'll leave both links below so you can follow along with the program and learn about the program if it's something that you would also like to do. So being day three, we're actually doing a lower body focus, so it is uh, cheated deadlifts as well as squat day. Uh, so we're starting off with conditioning. Like usual, I had some I had extra time today. Uh, as you'll learn from the other videos, if you don't have time, you're really cutting it short. Uh, drop out the conditioning and really just do max effort, volume, and dynamic, and then you're pretty much done for the day. But nevertheless, we did start off with some conditioning for the day, 10 minutes. Really simple, it was just some uh, rowing for a minute, uh, five jumps, as well as three pull-ups. So really simple, you really just wanted to get the blood flowing. Uh, I like to ramp up, so we start off quite quite steady, and then just bring up the, the speed and the tempo and pace as it is, so we're kind of sweating by the end of that 10 minutes, which means Sweating isn't an indicator of anything because I sweat a lot, but for me, once I start sweating, I know I'm pretty good to go. So we're following that conditioning up with around 30 to 35 minutes of maximum effort work. So today's consisted of front squatting, sumo deadlifts, uh, side planks, and rowing for 30 seconds. Uh, sorry, let me t correct you there. It is cheated deadlifts, not sumo deadlifts for those people playing along at home. Uh, so we're starting off with front squats. Uh, for the working sets for today, it is actually six sets of uh, working sets. The If you know the program, uh, we do play around a lot week to week, changing up the sets and the reps. Uh, today is actually a heavy single day for the sumo deadlift, so uh, the program likes to start off with the antagonist movement. Somewhat antagonist movement to the deadlift is the front squat, mainly m more so for the conventional deadlift uh, because with that narrower stance, it, it pulls the focus to the posterior chain. Once we widen out to a sumo stance, we add in a lip, bit more uh, hips and quads, which is very similar focus to the front squat. We're executing with a lot of uh, quad dominant squatting movement there because of weights just in the front of us. Uh, nevertheless, we did six sets of six at 185 for the front squats. A little bit light there, but I'm still uh, getting used to front squatting again, not my favorite movement, but generally when it's something you dislike, it's something you should do more because it's probably a sign of a weak point. And I definitely know my front squat is a weak point of mine, along with all the other many weak points I point out along the way. So we follow that with some sumo deadlifts. I have been pyramiding up in the weight to get to a top set. Uh, ideally, we hit that top weight with a second to last set and then the last set is a repetition of that same weight. But today, uh, I hadn't done sumo deadlifts in a while, so we did hit uh, a top set of 475 for a single, close to an RPE 9.5. Again, the sumo deadlift still feels a little awkward to me. I'm feeling a little uh, weird sensation in the hips just because of that wide stance. Something I'll just get used to. Uh, I'm, I'm not really... Uh, I didn't really perform the sumo deadlift a lot, so hopefully over the next couple of weeks over the program, uh, the sumo deadlift has become more of a familiar movement pattern for me and really able to get some more gains along the way. Now, if you watch my previous video, I argue that the sumo deadlift is neither good nor bad, just like any other movement we do. It's just another tool in the toolbox. So watch that video. Uh, I'll leave a link here somewhere. But moving on, then we do some side planks. Uh, I only got to 15 seconds a side, just because I was getting really tired from the heavy singles and the heavier front squats. And we wrap that up with some rowing for 30 seconds, just again, to get that conditioning in. Uh, in my training log, I write down the amount of meters I'm able to get for the 30 seconds so we can really gauge if I am slacking off or at least keeping par. For the most part, increasing along the way, so that's great. So really stoked with today's um, sumo deadlifting, hit 475, my all-time PR for the conventional deadlift is 495, so tracking very similarly there, 
you could use that as a case that the sumo deadlift is easier or my body type is built for the sumo deadlift. So I'm curious to see how the sumo deadlift is able to build up in this program because if I'm able to hit 475, let's see what that transference is from the conventional deadlift over to the sumo. But nonetheless, we'll move on to volume. So we had three sets of volume. Uh, because we did the heavy single, we're dropping that back to, for the sumo deadlift, we're targeting uh, the last two sets of five, first set AMRAP like usual, and we're knocking that down to 380 pounds. With that 380, I was able to hit eight, which was surprising as I look back at that. Uh, so that's really cool. I remember the days when 365 was a challenge. That was probably about two years ago. So, and that was a challenge for a single. So remember, progress takes a really long time. It's just the matter of the fact. It's There's no shortcuts here. So I'm really stoked to see that I hit 380 for a set of eight. That's really cool. Uh, the front squats, we hit 180. We kept the weight at 185, but I did drop that rep down from six down to five. And the side planks dropped that down from 15 seconds aside to 10 seconds aside. And the rowing definitely took a dip there. So today was a bit taxing on the conditioning system. No surprises there to me, but we were able to hit a heavy single, which was cool. And we did get a, a cool little rep PR there for 380 pounds. <clears throat> And now uh, we move on to the dynamic effort section of today. Today's dynamic section is just the squat. Uh, the program calls for a high bar squat. I'm trying to keep the barbell as high on my back as possible, but again, I have some weird form issues with the high bar back squat, just comfort and familiarity with the movement. Your mileage may vary. Nevertheless, it is a squat, a, my conventional squat that I like to use. Uh, so we did 10 minute EMOM. Uh, again, not gonna lie, the 10 minutes ran out to about 14 minutes there just because this squatting after this deadlifting is just tiring. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie, this is a brutal, brutal, brutal workout. It, it's, uh, as the weight gets heavier and the, and the rest stays the same, it's really taxing and it's really difficult to perform for me personally. So th the first couple of sets there that I do every minute on the minute and then as the sets progress probably towards the last five to ten, the last five sets there we're going 70 seconds, 80 seconds, 90 seconds. We're kind of increasing that rest period there. So all up we did a uh, 10 minute EMOM in 14 minutes. <laughs> but we did 255 pounds with some uh, pink bands from Elite FTS there. Again, this this program is great. I'm excited to see the gains. Um, uh, losing a little weight there, so that's kind of cool to see. Uh, it feels like my strength is kind of staying the same, if not increasing, whilst we're increasing a lot of conditioning adaptations. I feel like I feel like my condition has got a lot better. I'm asking a lot more out of the body than I have in the past in the aspect of GPP conditioning decreasing those rest periods and really compressing the workout and making the, the workout a really dense workout. And I think that's something that the Dark Horse program is really great at. It's condensing and making the hour and a half, hour 15 to hour and a half that you're in the gym, really, 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 really intense, which is awesome because we're still driving up heavy weights. We're not swapping this out for like really light weights and just doing some meaningless things we're actually trying to adapt with some strength gains while also trying to adapt to conditioning gains so that we're always uh, ready for something that may happen in the future that's kind of the mindset between brian olzer's training there he wants to be uh ready and adaptable to any situation given his background and and goals so i can see why this training program works really well it it, it it, it's able to strike that balance between increasing conditioning as well as increasing strength. I think he's found that nice little sweet spot there, provided you can keep up with the workout. So I would argue that you probably need a little bit of uh, background in, a little bit of training background just so you're not running yourself from the ground too too hard there and you're able to make it through these workouts. But again, you could probably just temper the weight selection in order to make it through that workout so that you can keep, I think the, the main point would be to focus on keeping the rest periods the same and keeping the workouts under an hour and a half, ideally an hour and 15 minutes. Really good for people that are strapped for time, have other priorities in life, don't want to spend two to three hours in the gym. Uh, something that I used to do, life has come up, so I'm really trying to find ways to get as most adaptations in the shortest amount of time. So I think this is one really, really cool program to use.
uh, that will help you achieve your goals while still keeping time in the gym to a minimum. So that's wrapping up the third day of the second week. A couple of thoughts I had after the workout. Something I heard a while ago, uh, somewhere, uh, I forget where I heard it from, but the basic idea was to have strong beliefs loosely held. And I really, really go along with that kind of mindset. It's a, it's a good way of thinking and looking away at the world. Because what it does is you find a belief and a tenant that you think is that you've researched and you really fall behind and you think it's a good idea, but you're always wanting to constantly be questioning that and really be able to drop it quickly if the logic behind it or your thoughts or your circumstances change, which means that you can't grasp onto these tenets forever because one thing that happens, I think, is when you're stuck in a practice like a dogmatic practice, you're not looking at different ways, you're not adopting a scientific mindset. You're constantly looking at how to self-reinforce and self-affirm the views that you currently believe. That's when you kind of get caught in a trap. I think we all get this and I think fitness is a huge, uh, like everything in life, fitness is one of those things where people fall into camps, whether that be nutrition camps such as like keto, uh, paleo, high carbs, low fat, high fat, all these different types of things, even even styles of working out. And you have CrossFit, bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, all sorts of different ways of training and different mindsets and a lot of dogmatic practices. This is good. This is bad. You can't do anything else other than this. And I think the problem with that is you, you close your mindset off to the rest of the adaptabilities in training. Once you start going down a path and not looking at any other pathways with reason you need to look at the other pathways but assess them with some science some evidence some logic as well and really look at if they're truly good or if they're truly bad and if they're not so bad why might they be good uh i like to adopt that mindset by looking at different styles of training different modalities different science behind it because it just expands your mindset if you find evidence to contrary to what you believe then assess why it is contrary to your belief and what your beliefs are and you might have to start questioning your own beliefs and your own systems and and programs that you have in place that might not be optimal for you, might not be as healthy for you just because some new evidence comes to light. Science is constantly changing. What we thought was healthy 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago is, is far different to what it is now. We used to cut people and bloodlet them back in the day under the guise of science and medicine. So things are constantly changing. It's getting better now because we have the scientific methodology of thinking. We actually have evidence-based findings and we're doing experiments. We're doing things that are a bit more scientific and with this new uh, wealth of knowledge we have with the internet, we can literally Google anything. It is a double-edged sword because you can Google anything and anyone can write anything. Here I am talking about fitness and I am not a medical professional, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, I'm just someone that's done it for a really long time. So again, keep what I say with a grain of salt, but keep what everybody says with a grain of salt. There are some things that you need to just find evidence for and you just need to dive deeper. And I think that's the thing that comes with this strong beliefs loosely held is they're loosely held because you're constantly questioning your own beliefs and you need to constantly question this so that you never fall into the trap of having a closed mind and doing the same thing repeatedly when there could be a better way of doing something. But this happens throughout history if you look at all the different things that have happened. We we get entrenched in a system of doing things and we always do it because it's the way we've always done it. Why fix what ain't broke? That type of mindset is a very dangerous mindset to, call, to, to fall into, I think, because it doesn't allow you to expand and grow. You need to adapt a growth mindset. So within reason... Obviously, you need to be changing and adapting your viewpoints around the world. And when I say within reason, you really need to research new points of view to make sure that they are ground in some science and some evidence-based research and that it's something that you can adapt to your own lifestyle. So again, there's always a different tool for a different reason. We have, just like you build a toolkit with all the different tools, I keep going back to this notion, but I think it fits so well into this uh, into the growth mindset is just having different tools available to your disposal because the more tools we have, the better we are as a mechanic or a woodworker or whatever the case may be. The more options you have, the more free you are to make solid and good choices. And I think personally, it shifted a lot for me. This is why I 
encourage everybody to have these strong beliefs Lucy held, have a growth mindset because I wouldn't be training the way I'm training now if I hadn't stopped trying to learn more about what it is that I'm trying to do. I'm always trying to learn more about health and fitness because it's something that I'm interested in and it's something that's really important to me personally. And that might be different for you, but I think at the very least, do some research about your own health and fitness, about what's happening out in the science world, about what's happening in the sports medicine world, because so many things have changed and we're getting a new insight, we're getting new knowledge, and it's just, it's hot. It's so easy to access good, solid information. They're freely available. There are people out there that are putting out free information that are that normally would be closed off to acad- academics and people that would work at the university or journal research papers. Now people are putting that information out for free. They're even analyzing that for you so you don't have to read the the ins and outs of this scientific paper, which I would recommend doing too. But if you don't have the time where you don't have the predilection to do that, definitely look at someone else who's kind of breaking down the science for you and giving out some real world applications. There are some great resources out there. And I think I would highly recommend it because it's changed my mindset a lot, even over the last months, even especially over the last decade, my training has shifted so much. And I think I'm a, I'm, I'm better for it now, but if I didn't do the bad things I did before, I don't think it would have led me to where I am now. So it's kind of, you have to go through this journey of growth and development. You're not going to be perfect from day one. No one is with regards to anything. Everyone always has to take a journey of development and that development takes time, trials, errors, mistakes, uh, and that's learning. That's all part of the process. What do you think is correct today is probably going to be proven wrong, could be proven wrong tomorrow. And you need to be able to be so fluid with your thinking that you can adapt and change and become a better person by thinking about why your thoughts are wrong. Because when you question yourself, it helps ground you in, in, you need to question yourself so that you can come up with evidence to prove that you're right because you're looking for evidence to prove that you're wrong. Sounds weird, but that's what it comes down to. Anyway, they're my thoughts for the day. Uh, Check out the training vlog series. I'll put a playlist, I'll put a playlist link right here. Uh, That way you can track the training progress and my thoughts and and ponderings along the way for the Dark Horse training program. This has been Selwyn from Win Strength, and remember, a better life through strength.